Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the Webley Fosbury, a recoil operated revolver. Ooh. This particular example is what is known as the Model 1903, although that's less than official. But before we get into it, let's get it over to the light box. With an overall length just under 10 and one half inch and sitting just about two and one half pounds in weight, this is a fairly large handgun. Now, of course, this is chambering the big bore 455 Webley cartridge, a total of six rounds stored in its cylinder, accessible through the top brake loading system and simultaneous eject. If you do not want to like, comment, or subscribe to the videos online, you know, to help with engagement, what else do you do, Othias? Well, the only other way I know of is to write down the URL for this video on a letter and send it to your aging parents in the oh. mail with a stamp. Yeah, they like those. Double stamp it. Now, I wanna be clear, we've discussed the Webley Top Break revolvers in previous episodes. So check those out if you want more information on where this sort of starts at. Instead, this is gonna be a long episode even as is, so I'm gonna go straight to the bit about Fosbury. George Vincent Fosbury was born in April of 1832. He was the first child to an Anglican pastor in Wiltshire, Ireland, though at some point in his early childhood, the family would move to the southern tip of the Isle of Wight. In 1846, his parents would move to France, where two of his siblings would be born. George, however, was sent to England, where he would attend Eton. In 1850, George Fosbury began tutoring for and then testing his way into the Honorable East India Company. Unlike the Royal Army, this British trade monopoly turned government had better merit-based opportunities for both pay and promotion. Fosbury would sail for Calcutta in January of 1852, serving four years as an ensign with the Bengal Native Infantry, first in the 48th Regiment and then the infamous 3rd. During his time in India, he would begin experimenting in arms technology, at first making his own brass cannon and designing artillery shells. In January of 1857, he would be sent back to England with the reason listed as sick leave, probably some local disease. This proved to be quite the stroke of luck as he missed out on the deadly mutiny of his own 3rd Regiment while he was away. This was, of course, part of the larger Indian Rebellion of 1857, in which a coalition of native Indian forces attempted to overthrow the rule of the East India Company. While the endeavor ultimately failed from the perspective of India, it would spell the end of the company, ushering in more direct British rule. That same year, Fosbury would be promoted to lieutenant, likely due to the death of a number of officers. In 1860, he would attend the School of Musketry at Hythe, where he passed a course that enabled him to serve as a musketry instructor in his new regiment back in India. Around this same period, he would develop his own explosive bullets with a particular emphasis on long range precision. By 1863, he'd worked out a two piece solution for the pattern 53 Enfield and he'd get a chance to test that out in combat. During the Umbela campaign, an expedition into the border area between Afghanistan and the Punjab province, Fosbury would bring along his bullets and explosives and was put in charge of 32 of the best marksmen available. Equipped with his explosive bullets, these men wreaked havoc by not only delivering gruesome injuries directly, but also because the visible strikes from the rifle fire could be used to quickly and more quietly range for artillery, which could then be brought to bear with devastating effect and very little warning for the defenders. Because of these and other successes of the explosive bullet, they were outlawed in war by the St. Petersburg Declaration of 1868. During that same 1863 Umbela campaign, George Fosbury would himself be involved in direct combat for control of Crag Piquet, a contested prominence that changed hands repeatedly. For his fierce combat in the narrow winding paths in subsequent pursuit of a fleeing enemy, Fosbury would receive the Victoria Cross. This greatly assisted his rise to captain in 1864 and then major in 1866. By that year, he was living in Devon and was working on a new breech loading rifle for the British Army. This was a trapdoor style of action that sadly did not clear the trials. Luckily, Ian over at Forgotten Weapons has done a video on an existing example in case you're ever curious. 
Next up, Fosbury became interested in early machine guns, particularly the Montini Mitrailleuse, even making his own improvements to its manufacture with the hopes of British adoption. Thankfully for his own sake, he would be removed from the project as it saved him something of a reputational black eye. You see, the Montini had not proved to be the expected uh, wonder weapon. Uh, when the Prussians knocked on Paris's door in 1870, it made little difference. Now to keep things tight, I'll just say that Fosbury would spend another decade between India and the UK, rising to Lieutenant Colonel in 1876. The very next year, he would refuse to leave England for his next mandatory tour in India. This meant that he had to resign his commission, and despite 25 overall years of service out of his life, he had taken just short of, well, six years leave for various activities and illnesses. Had he spent just six more months in India, he would have had an annual pension for life. And honestly, this event is one of many little things that seem to point to something careless about Fosbury. He seems to have constantly wasted money, often renting homes above his current means. Even his mother's will had special carve-outs to prevent him from wasting his own inheritance. Well, without his income from the Indian Army, he'd need to invent, and so we see a flurry of patents for diaphragm pumps, self-sealing hulls, remote-controlled handsome cab doors, since a type of taxi. Uh, by the early 1880s, however, he had returned to firearm inventions, even moving himself to Liège, Belgium. A variety of quick loaders, magazine conversions, and even a slide-action repeating rifle would follow. Featured here is his metallic patch developed alongside of, well, Henri Piper. Smokeless powder sort of halted this one. His real hit came in 1885, and seems to have been another invention developed from his experiences in India. You see, Fosbury was thinking on the matter of riot control, and realized that the use of buckshot was certainly effective on an irate crowd. However, carrying around a shotgun meant not being able to tote around a more accurate carbine, which was more useful on the day-to-day -day activities. These concerns led to a blending of both in the form of a rifled choke. This allowed for a simple long arm that could shoot both a variety of shot, but also make short range accurate hits with a solid bullet. While it had initially been a martial concern, Fosbury's design would gain great interest in the commercial realm as a flexible option for game hunters. Produced by Holland and Holland, the Paradox gun is still regarded as a commercial classic and proved to be Fosbury's most profitable venture. From there, he worked on a series of slide-action rifles, uh, mostly vaguely similar to the Spencer shotgun, but one design does stand out. You can see more of it again on Forgotten Weapons, but Fosbury developed a six-lug bolt head that went along with this particular gun. Efficient and strong, some of you may recognize that it would be put to use many, many years later, to great effect. All right, so that's George Fosbury from 1832 through the 1880s. An amazing life, just as was, but he was not done yet, because the first patent we know of that applies to our revolver today would come about in 1895, making him 63 years old at the start of all of this. But before we see it, let's talk about his motivation. Fosbury also knew the value of the emerging automatic pistols, although today we can list numerous advantages they would soon have over the traditional revolver, Fosbury saw two that stood out to him. First, always having a single action pull, even without cocking the hammer, just single action, every time. And second, automatics had the ability to cushion recoil, uh, in other words, lightning that perceived oomph from the blow. The only problem is that early autoloaders were having a devil of a time with even small calibers, uh, lighter powered cartridges. Any attempt to make them larger or more powerful invited a lot of mass and a lot of complication. This was a problem for George Fosbury. In a lecture he titled On Pistols and delivered to the Royal United Service Institution in May of 1896, he lauded the large caliber flat nose, slow moving 455 service cartridge. He spoke of the absolute necessity of stopping power in a service handgun. The pistol was meant to halt a threat even with a single hit in Fosbury's mind. 
Now, in fairness, George might have been uh, patting his own future pockets with that lecture because in the previous year, he had already filed a patent on his solution to the large caliber automatic problem. He had cleaved a Colt single action army in half, creating a sliding upper assembly, which would recoil down the solid frame. As it traveled rearward, the upper assembly cocked an external arm attached to the hammer. The assembly was then returned forward by an internal coil spring set at the front of the frame. In testing his invention, it appears that the Colt lock work likely proved to be a little too delicate. The gun itself was already near obsolete and the American brand was a bit far from home. It would be much more sensible and potentially profitable for him if he applied his ideas to the British service revolt. The good old 455 Webley, which also sported a rapid ejecting, rapid reloading top break action. At the same time, Fosbury had noticed that the initial jolt, the bang of a fired cartridge being transmitted directly to the lock work created a far too sudden of a snap and it tended to damage especially the hand, that little bit of metal that indexes the cylinder. His 1896 patent would therefore be built on a Webley frame and now the hammer was cocked by an extension at its rear attached to a roller. This kept it inside the gun. The recoil spring was moved into the grip and now presses on a tipping transfer bar, which acts as a buffer to dampen recoil, hopefully sparing the lock work from undue harm. In the end, however, it seems that the hand was proving to be a weak point in the design no matter what he did, and Fosbury would need an alternative means to rotate the cylinder. Luckily, Elijah Root had solved this back in 1855 with his patent for milling a guide track into the outside of a revolver cylinder so that the linear movement of a peg could be transformed into the rotation of the cylinder. While only prototypes of these exist, Remington did use something similar on their multi-barreled Derringer, originally termed Elliott's Pocket Revolver, starting in 1861. Now these saw limited sales as they were quickly replaced with another design. The same general feature would again return on the 1878 Mauser Zigzag Revolver, which actually also saw commercial production. While still limited, it at least remained recognizable. Fosbury would be the next to try this particular style of revolver on, as the external grooves were far stronger than the traditional hand. Now, I'm not entirely sure when George Fosbury would actually approach Webley and Scott. Just because he's using their revolver as a basis for his development, it doesn't mean that he was in direct contact yet. However, the relationship was apparently already underway in 1899, and for Webley, Fosbury looked like something of a golden goose, potentially. P. Webley and Sons, W. N. C. Scott and Sons, and Richard Ellis and Son had all merged in 1897 to form the Webley and Scott Revolver and Firearms Company Limited. I guess they ran out of Sons. The newly consolidated company was looking to be an industry leader, both in terms of production and in innovation. Presently, they were the supplier of handguns to the crown, but Thomas Webley was well aware that nothing lasts forever. It seems he was acutely aware of a growing predicament in the gun industry. The commercial revolver market was flooded with inexpensive Belgian imports, making competition at the low end difficult. So Webley sold on quality, which put them in competition with US firms like Colt. And at the high end of the market were the new auto-loading pistols, which were becoming more capable and more popular every year. Wisely, Webley saw the Marshall Automatic as inevitable and wanted to position itself in order to profit. One avenue they explored would be the massive, complicated, powerful, and ultimately failing Mars Automatic. A gun that certainly deserves its own episode someday. To Webley, Fosbury's design represented its exact opposite. Simple and familiar, the auto revolver was a much safer bet, and so they took it. Of course, it needed refinement, and so they put their own expert on the job, a man who was already toiling over what would be the Mars. William John Whiting, born in Darleston in 1864, son of a lock filer, he had attended the local parish church school for six solid years of public education. Whiting then joined Webley in 1876 at the age of 12 as a fetch and carry boy. On his 16th birthday, he began a five-year apprenticeship under Philip and Henry Webley, after which he was an official toolmaker. 
Following the British adoption of the Mark I government model, Whiting would move up to workshop foreman of the revolver department. After his father's unexpected death in 1893, uh, William took over his role as works manager. Now, William Whiting was keen on automatics and recognized their potential. As I said before, he would be put to work on both the Mars, and now, for our story today, he's going to go to work on the Fosbury. Now, his job likely began in about 1899, at least as far as this gun goes. Maybe a little earlier, I have not been able to find documentation of the earliest stages, as earliest stages of this. It was, however, stalled by the Second Boer War. This conflict between the British Empire and the Dutch Boer states generated a dramatic increase in arms sales, and so Webley had its hands full just keeping up with production for about a year. With the contracts again dwindling, the decision was made to focus on the auto revolver in an attempt to lock in new sales and future-proof the company. This is where things get a little murky again, as Webley seems to have worked through a number of prototypes, but still gave them serial numbers. So the very first model is more of an evolution unto itself. Let's start with serial number one, which is conveniently known as the Type 1. Here we have the tell-tail external grooves, which are navigated by a sprung camming peg mounted off the left side of the frame, so not internal at all. The hammer still cocks by an extension at its rear, which rolls inside the back strap. The rear of the cylinder is rebated, and just in front of that are a series of notches which engage a spring tab in the top strap, preventing the cylinder from rotating when the gun is popped open. You can't see it here, but the back strap was hinged to fold outwards, easing disassembly and helping to stack that recoil spring on assembly. The Type 1 has no safety, nor holster guides. Now I'm unsure if the Type 1 or maybe the one I'm about to show you were the model shown, but there was an early demonstration at the Webley Fosbury at the Beasley shoot in 1900. The sporting press loved it. Recoil was light, trigger pull was always single action, and it still fired that big 455 service cartridge. Several prizes were actually won by shooters trialing the gun. However, there were the usual hiccups in operation. Whether or not the Type 1 was the gun there at Bisley, the major problem was that the left side camming pin, which apparently would sometimes allow the cylinder to run in the same groove over and over again, leaving you trying to fire a spent casing twice. So they would progress, and we see the Type 2. The camming pin is now in the center of the frame directly under the cylinder. The hammer no longer cocks from a tail at its rear, like we saw in the patents. Instead, the tail now points downwards and snags a stud inside the frame. This carries over into our gun today. The cylinder is now rebated at the front, and the zigzag grooves are set to serve the same purpose as the abandoned notches, allowing the spring catch in the top strap to hold the cylinder in place when the gun is opened. Now fitted with a safety, this first version is a lever with a button-like end. When flipped up, it acts directly on the hammer tail. Continuing to evolve, the safety would change into a hook, which caught a stud on the upper assembly. Throwing the safety cammed the assembly back slightly, disengaging the sear from the hammer. The cylinder was now uniform in diameter with large flutes at the rear. Six smaller flutes are actually cut into the zigzag grooves at the front of the cylinder now. These also serve to keep the cylinder rotating in the correct direction when firing. From Whiting's 1901 patent, we can see a sort of teeter-totter spring. The tab at the rear prevented rotation when the action is opened. The inclined tab at the front was biased to prevent the cylinder from rotating backwards, engaging in those cuts. And it also encouraged it to further turn clockwise every time. The Type 3 Webley Fosbury is also unique in that it seems to have a fair bit of overlapping production with the final version of the gun, what I would call the Type 4 or perhaps just the proper model 1901. While it's hard to see, the overall diameter of the cylinder has been reduced, allowing the fluting to be abandoned. The safety lever again works internally. Uh, it pushes on a secondary arm that cams back the upper assembly, placing the hammer at half cock and separating the trigger and sear. This operation also worked at full cock. It was this pattern that would be by far the most common of the Model 1901 Webley Fosberries, so named for production starting in, you guessed it, 1901. 
three barrel options were available, the standard model with 6-inch barrel priced at 110 shillings. You could save a bit by opting for a 4-inch barrel, 105 shillings, or 115 shillings would get you a 7 and 1 half inch target model. Now I'm sorry to tell you this, but the gun I have here today is not a model 1901, so we have even more ground to cover, folks. Let's start with Webley's obvious goal, military contracts. Well, even before commercial production got underway, examples were being sent to the War Office's Small Arms Committee. They had already seen examples of Bergman, Roth, and Browning self-loaders, all of which had not been adopted, as none of them could chamber the standard 455 service ammunition. In his report of May 1901, the superintendent expressed some enthusiasm calling the Webley Fosbury a very great step in the advance of the service pattern. Unfortunately, this enthusiasm did not last. The example is presumed to be a Type 3, and it quickly suffered a number of problems in extensive testing. First, the rear of the recoiling upper assembly was quite sharp and could possibly injure the hand of a shooter. The safety catch had managed to engage while shooting, jamming the action. And finally, and most seriously, whenever the revolver was tested with exposure to sand, the upper assembly would often fail to return forward, requiring the shooter to snap the gun downwards in order to whip it back into place. Now, despite these issues, the committee felt that the gun had promise, so Webley was invited to make modifications and resubmit his design, with whatever improvements could make it more martially acceptable. Returning in September of 1901, the improved model, likely a Type 4, suffered immediate problems as well. First, it was nearly 9 ounces heavier than the Mark IV service revolver. Also, the safety was extremely heavy to disengage. In the first 30 shots, several failed to fully recoil, preventing a follow-up. This cleared up over the next 50 rounds, and even fine sand and dirt did not cause a jam. However, once disassembled, they found the half-cocked position on the sear had broken off. 200 further shots saw 36 failures of the recoiling mechanism, although things got better the more the gun was worked in, and the next 200 went smoother at which point the cylinder retaining spring weakened and allowed the cylinder to walk out of alignment and the hammer to strike between chambers, damaging its firing pin. Now those were just functioning complaints. At the same time, there were some logistical er issues emerging where committee members began realizing that autoloading pistols had some other clear advantages. Many autoloaders had last round hold opens, which indicated that the gun was empty. The Fosbury required you to count your rounds, just like the service Webley. Autoloaders often used detachable magazines or stripper clips, which meant that they could be both unloaded and loaded much faster. The Fosbury had simultaneous eject, but no inherent speed loading system. It's worth mentioning that a number of commercial options were already available for the Webley service revolver, notably the Perdot and Watson loaders. William Whiting himself would develop a simple clip, much like the later moon clips for the US 1917 revolvers, in response to these trial concerns. Unfortunately, this was not enough. The committee felt the Webley Fosbury was an excellent target pistol with low recoil and a light trigger pull, but its martial value was limited, as it presented few advantages over the service revolver as was, and not as many as an actual auto-loading pistol would. This decision would force Webley and Scott to reposition the Fosbury to be better adapted to the commercial market, where, just as the committee had said, it did very well in target shooting. Even in that sphere, however, the Fosbury's biggest competition was going to come again from autoloaders, and so the decision was made to meet them somewhere in the middle, uh, adopting what they felt was going to be the most popular autoloading cartridge, which was fairly hard of a call to make in 1902. Ultimately, they would bet on the success of the Colt 1902, which chambered the 38 ACP cartridge, not to be confused with 380. This semi-rim cartridge had been introduced with the Colt 1900 pistol, and it actually started out a fair bit spicier, but the early autos just couldn't hold up, so it was downgraded a bit. By the time the cartridge had really settled into its stride, the US government declared it would only be considering big bore. This effectively limited its success but none of that was known yet in 1902. In adopting a smaller caliber, Webley could make a smaller handgun, but the grip size and profile was a pretty strong feature. Instead, they would only slightly shrink the frame, about half an inch shorter. 
The cylinder would also be shrunk a, a wee bit in length, but the diameter remained basically the same because they bored eight chambers instead of six. Again, Whiting paired the new gun with a quick loading clip, now holding, of course, eight cartridges and clearly beating out the World War I 1917 moon clip. Moving to the internals, the previous Fosberries had used a coil spring set inside the grip to return the upper assembly. Now, the 38 caliber would use a V-spring. We've actually seen this system before, as it would be used on the later Webley self-loading pistol, for which we have an episode. Its inclusion on the Fosberry eliminated the hinged backstrap in favor of removable side plates for easier servicing. It's also worth noting the shift in that pivot point. Another new feature on the 38, an improved cylinder guide and latch system in the top strap. The rear stud still prevented rotation when the action was opened, and the front still provides a rotational bias, but it now also served to hold the cylinder to the barrel assembly, eliminating the need for the service revolver style of guide yoke. We've seen these on all the Marshall Webley revolvers, a tipping yoke that disengaged when the gun was closed, allowing for free, smooth spinning and tipping up when the gun was opened so that the cylinder did not escape during loading. The disadvantage of this system is that you need to unscrew the guide arm in order to remove the cylinder for service. With the new system, all you needed to do was press a button on the top strap in order to release the cylinder for cleaning and maintenance. And so we see that this new model of 1902 is an eight round 38 ACP with other minor improvements abounding, uh, like making the trigger guard an integral feature of the frame or the lowered hammer spur. Later production would also include vulcanite grip plates instead of wood. Now, I want to be clear here. We are now talking about an 8-shot, 38 ACP semi-automatic revolver. That's so rad on novelty alone, Webley should be seeing success at this point, right? Wrong. But the big question is going to be why. Well, the problems were both external and internal on this particular matter. First, the Model 1902 really entered the market in 1903, the same year as the new Pistol Act. This set down a number of requirements, including needing a gun or game license to buy a pistol and required the seller to keep a ledger of sales. This pressure on the pistol market meant that domestic sales started dropping off across the board. The other problem was shared by the first Webley Fosbury as well, the 1901, that would be price. For a standard six inch barrel, the price was the same as the older 455, 110 shillings. However, the Colt 1902 was retailing around 85 shillings, making it something of an easy decision to favor. Ultimately, production of the 38 caliber can be measured in the hundreds, and by 1913, they would no longer be marketed. The sales failures must have been acute from the start though, as in February of 1904, they decided to strip down more than 100 of the 38s in order to convert them over to a new 455. This pattern had already been decided back in 1903, which is actually, well actually this gun right here, the, the Model 1903. And instead of looking at a bunch of patents, we can take a closer look. All right, we have our gun, and just for comparison, I have a Mark IV right here, the standard service arm of roughly the same time. And you can see mm, there's some key differences, especially just coming off of the contours. We've got this nice proud backstrap here that's going to give you a nice deep grip for your hand versus this bird's grip, you know, bird's beak grip. Uh, we have the shorter barrel here. We have the much longer target barrel here. Uh, in a lot of ways, just to cover, if you haven't seen our Webley episode, the Fosbury was ahead of the game just in ergonomics because, as we'll see, during the war, they will go ahead and bring in this Mark VI, which shares a lot more in common with the Webley Fosbury in terms of ergonomics, and that's specifically because this gun and this gun came from the target pistol uh, Webleys, and so the military eventually found that, yes, we would like to have this contouring. Yes, we would like to have the longer sight radius, the longer barrel, those sorts of things. And those come from not just this, but actually from a shared ancestor of being like the commercial WG pistols and things like that. All right, so specific to the Fosbury, 
What have we got going on? Well, the most notable feature is that this is not a double action. So if I pull the trigger, nothing's happening. The gun must be cocked and fire single action only. Boom, click, right? Sorry, I don't wanna really dry fire something like this. Let me just do that again. Boom, click, right? The way this would work is you would fire your first shot uh, and then uh, the gun would recoil. So you would hold it. The barrel and upper assembly would want to go rearward while you held still. And then boom, that recocks the hammer and the spring inside the grip drives it forward. You can see the rotation of that cylinder. So then you would fire single action again, boom. And then click, click. Okay, is that making sense? Now, as I said in those military trials, the problem was it would go back and then snag and not come all the way forward. And when it's not all the way forward, you can't drop the hammer, see? It's gotta go all the way back into battery and then boom, we can fire again. Now, being that this is a semi-automatic, uh, we're going to have a manual safety because we'd be carrying it around with the action cocked uh, or decocked on an empty chamber. Uh, this does not have a rebound position, so I would not consider it a good idea to carry this with the hammer down on a loaded chamber. But the safety can be applied with either the hammer down or the hammer back. And in both cases, actually, you know what? I'm gonna put it down so you can see more of the movement. With the hammer down, we'll really see what's happening. Because as I lift this safety up, it's going to cam this rearward. So watch her go. And this is a little stiff with age, so I'm gonna give it a little bump. See it go rearward? And it's gonna put that hammer back into a half cock position. So the gun is no longer engaging the sear. It's not blocking the trigger, it's just that I'm not able to influence that hammer whatsoever. It's in its half cock position. Now, this gun is of course old and worn. And so the safety has some extra oomph to it, but we do know from the military trials that releasing the safety was considered to be very difficult or at least more difficult than it should be. And so if I go to oh, flex on that, you'll hear a nice click. I'm unsure how much of that is this gun being 100 plus years old and how much of it is what the military was complaining about at the time. But that releases everything back forward and from there we can use the gun. And just to prove it to you, I should be able to put that safety in at full cock and then disengage it at full cock. That is not an easy operation to do without a supporting hand. That is very difficult on this particular gun. Uh, I have not handled another Fosbury, so I cannot tell you if it's more difficult or less on others. Now. In order to load or unload this gun, hammer down or hammer up, we're going to do the same thing we did, would do on a normal Webley. We're gonna push on this latch and then we're going to pop her open, at which point we're going to simultaneously eject all of our cartridges until we go to the furthest point, snaps in, ready for reloading again, either with a loading device or singularly. It's pretty cool. Let me get that for you one more time just so you guys can see in the other camera. Up and then boop in and you can load your cartridges there. All right, if we wanna remove the cylinder, well, we just have to hit this button up top, but I'm gonna zoom in for that. All right, I'm gonna start with the service Webley. Some of you may remember it from our previous episode, but uh, this thing has a unique feature, which is that the cylinder is practically on a bearing. It's nice and smooth. Even a hundred years later, these are always in great shape. And the reason for that is there's not really a latch mechanism for retaining the cylinder front and back. It doesn't really drag on anything when it's sort of floated in the gun. So when this is closed. Now, obviously, as I open it, there's spring tension because this is popping out and yet the cylinder doesn't go shooting out of the gun. And the reason for that is a floated or rather a yoke that allows it to be floated when closed and then uh, snatches up on a little ring in there whenever we open the gun. Now that is driven by this contour here in this spud at the end of this little arm, okay? If you want to remove the cylinder from the gun, you must take a coin, a uh, screwdriver or something and loosen this screw, which I have already done, and then remove it. Now in removing it, you're now responsible for this wherever, whatever battlefield you're in that you're cleaning up your gun, so don't lose it. I don't like small parts laying around on disassembly. From there, we can turn this arm, which allows us to drop the yoke, which is also a little bit of a fiddle. There we go. And now we can remove our cylinder for cleaning and service. So a little involved, and of course, leaving a screw out in the wind. Not ideal. On the Webley Fosbury, we have a better system. The cylinder is also just sort of floating in there, nice and smooth. However, when we open it, it will not smoothly rotate. 
It will not rotate because it must be held in place out of battery so that when reassembled, it lines up properly. I'll show you why in a moment. But if we want to remove that cylinder on this system, we simply press this button and pull. That's it. Let me pull that guy out and I'll show you why that works. If I flip this over and then I'm going to desperately try to get it where the front camera can see inside of there. There we go is a blade of sorts that has a pivot at the center. It's actually a couple of parts. You'll see it better in the animation, but you see when I press the button, see it flexing at the rear there. That's what's releasing. So it's just a little sliver of blade. Now that little sliver of blade is actually biased in a certain direction. Uh, and what it does is it acts on these scallops at the front of the cylinder to not only keep it from coming out of the gun when we pop it open, but it also uh, biases the gun to rotate in the correct direction and resists rotating in the wrong direction. That's very critical to the operation of the Fosberry. Now what prevents rotation is actually, and again, I'll have to try to get this where you guys can see it, is this uh, front spud up in here. This guy uh, at the rear rather, sorry, not the front, the rear. He's locking into the opposite uh, guide raceway on the cylinder. So let's explain how the cylinder works then. Obviously, a lot of you can see visually that this really is the uh, description of the motion of the revolver, the rotational motion of the revolver writ onto the outside of it. And the way it works is you have a fixed point that is in the frame. Uh, let me show you that. Uh, it is right there, uh, patented plastic. This little spud right here does not move. It's fixed to the lower frame, whereas the upper assembly recoils. Uh, I can actually get that to happen without the cylinder in place in a little bit. There we go. So watch the birdie and I'll just cock, stay still. See how it's staying still the whole time. And what that causes is a back and like an inverted back and forth motion. So while that's static, this is moving. Uh, everything's in relation to each other. So ultimately, this little spud is being drawn in and out of the grooves of this cylinder. Uh, so if you imagine my patented plastic and pokey is the cylinder, uh, actually I'd be turned this way with the front of the gun that way. The spuds here, we fire the gun, boom, we hit this wall. It biases this way, recoils all the way. The re spring returns it forward, hits that wall and boom, that's our lock position. So this becomes the uh, anti-rotation device when we're forward. So uh, what would normally be sort of your uh, in-battery lock is now just the position of that pin. So it really does simplify the revolver in a lot of ways. And again, boom, and we trace, and boom, right? You guys get the idea. It's a super simple mechanism, but again, one that's prone to outside fouling because it can pack into these grooves and therefore we're no longer describing the rotation of our piece. While I have this cylinder, uh, and actually this frame, I want to explain something. The frame can be very hard to tell, even if you have two of the guns next to each other, but there is essentially a sandwich of large and small frames. Uh, when these were first made, they were using, again, the eight shot uh, version of the frame, the smaller frame. Then they went to a larger frame, and then they found that the smaller frame was better and they went back to it later on in production, or perhaps they were consuming parts from the early 1901 pistols. I'm not sure why, but they started small, they got larger, they got small again. You could barely tell looking at photos of these, but you can tell more easily on the cylinders because the small frame guns had smaller cylinders. This was possible because of the 455 Mark II cartridge being shorter. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Webley Fosbury cylinders are actually shorter than standard, there we go, standard 455 cylinders like this one off that Mark IV, if they're the small frame. The 1901s and the large frame 1903s would have the same length of cylinder. So hopefully that helps you understand the differences in them. And it gives you a quick comparison in order to tell which one you're dealing with at the time. <sighs> okay. All right, backing out. Uh, again, I'm gonna show you how to reassemble this. You just feel for the groove and then push in and you're done. So that's super easy compared to reassembling the whole regular Webley. And again, the reason you have to have this non-rotating and in the correct orientation is because you want to have the matching groove come down on that spud when you close the action and she's ready to rock and roll. Since I don't really want to have to take this apart and reassemble it, let's get a look at the internals with a bit of computer magic. To load our Fosbury, we'll press on the barrel catches lever Note that this also pushes the hammer into the half cock position. As we pivot the barrel down, the extractor lever drives the extractor 
until the upper assembly pinches the lever inward, releasing the extractor to spring back flush to the cylinder. From here, we can load our cartridges. Notice that as we close the action, a flat lever in the top strap is tipped, freeing the cylinder to rotate. Once loaded, we can draw the hammer back, which is powered by its own V-spring. At full cock, the hammer rests on this independent sear. When we pull the trigger, it's tipped to release. As the upper assembly recoils rearward, the extension at the base of the hammer is tipped by a stud in the frame, recocking the hammer. This spring-loaded extension at the rear of the trigger serves as a disconnect. Pulling the trigger presses it against the sear, and when the action cycles, that same sear pushes it forward, leaving it disengaged. Releasing the trigger allows it to spring back into place. While recoil drives the upper assembly rearward, this V-spring is what returns it forward. It does so by powering this transfer bar, which actually behaves like a permanently released hammer, always driving the upper assembly forward. The safety lever features an internal channel. When flipped, it drives a pin attached to the upper assembly rearward. This either ignores a fully cocked hammer or would push a dropped hammer into the half-cocked position. More importantly, in either case, it disengages the trigger from the sear, which is also how this gun prevents firing when the upper assembly is not all the way home. Releasing the safety allows the upper assembly to spring forward and allows this gun to be fired again. Cylinder rotation is achieved thanks to the complex grooves on its exterior and this fixed pin. As the upper assembly recoils, the cylinder moves and the pin remains static, which causes it to guide the cylinder into rotating thanks to the channels cut in its surface. Counter rotation is prevented by this inclined flat spring in the top strap. Notice it is biased to prevent counterclockwise rotation while allowing clockwise rotation. All right, that's just about it. A series of complex interactions over fewer parts than you might expect. Wild. Now let's go shoot it. Definitely a unique experience, but was it a profitable one? Well, the new model of 1903 was submitted for limited government testing. However, the initial impressions just repeated the same issues as the 1901 trial, and so Webley let the matter drop. They would also submit their gun to the United States in 1905, as the Americans were also locked onto big bore only. Uh, it would see further testing in 1907 here. U.S. Ordnance had the same problem with sand and dirt, preventing the action from returning to battery. They also noted that reloading on horseback was more difficult than the magazine-fed Colts. Overall, they felt the automatic mechanism added unnecessary weight and complexity for very little gain. And that's about it for the Fosbury's martial history, at least it would be if not for private purchases by British military officers. These were mostly handled through the Army and Navy Cooperative Society, and some favor was found in India, probably thanks to Fosbury's own reputation, and maybe his Paradox gun. Advertising focused on the Fosbury's use of service ammunition, meaning an officer could get some of the advantages of an automatic without having to constantly pay for and pack in his own ammo. Even with all that said, annual sales to military personnel rarely cleared 80 units, so not a major impact on the British Empire. This would change only slightly when war were declared.
<laughs> and with that, there was a brief spike in commercial sales. Young British officers really wanted to stick with 455 just in case. Unfortunately, they didn't prove their worth in the trenches. Well, the guns, the officers did great. Uh, sand, dirt, and mud easily jammed this action, and they just as quickly fell out of favor. Webley was put to work on producing official revolvers like the new Mark VI that had borrowed heavily from popular target models. Even with production of the Fosbury having already been a trickle for years and grinding to a halt in 1916 during a war of great shortages of armament, these guys did not sell out. They were still sitting there finished and ready on the shelf unbought. That's not a great look uh, for this particular pistol. I will say there was one teeny little silver lining for the Fosbury as it did finally see official military adoption. The Royal Naval Air Service was caught short on pistols as the Webley self-loader struggled to keep up with demand. A number of commercial handguns were bought up including Colt 1911s and 66 Webley Fosberries. That's right, 60 standard 6 inch barrels and 6 more with the 7 and 1 half inch target barrel. We did it boys! Technically. Okay, so a bit lackluster. How were commercial sales overall? Well, serials tell us that total sales between 1901 and 1924-ish, which is apparently when the gun is no longer appearing in catalogs, we managed to rack up mm, shy of 4,500, which means they were likely a commercial failure and making them a rare and valuable collectible today. Which is why I want to thank my friend Phoenix Fart for lending us his Fosbury for this episode. He might not be much of a talker, but he sure does love some funky firearms. Tell him thank you for us. Returning to our inventors, in 1903, William Whiting became a member of the board of directors for Webley. He would go on to develop the 455 self-loading pistol that we've seen before, and ended up leading Webley through its probably most challenging financial years. He would retire after the 1920 Firearms Act further wrecked the British domestic market. He lost two of his three sons in the war, which apparently shook his passion for arms design, so his retirement was not unexpected. He would succumb to a diabetic coma and pass in 1924. George Fosbury would manage to squeeze a pension from the India office starting in 1892. However, his income was still much smaller than his pride, and he would fall into genteel poverty, frequently moving around. Likely this was an attempt to avoid creditors and pretending that the servants had taken the day off. Also yesterday. He would pass from Uremic coma in May of 1907. The impoverished Fosbury left no will, and no marker was placed on his grave. Now I hate to leave things on a down note like that, so I'd like to share what is probably my favorite quote from the entire Wesley Fosbury endeavor. It comes from a sports reporter who in 1901 recalled a conversation that he had had with George Fosbury at the previous 1900 demonstration. The author decided to comment on the simple genius of the automatic revolver, pondering why it had not been done already by someone else. But when the writer remarked on the simplicity to Colonel Fosbury, the latter replied, try to make one. So many feelings in so few words, but sadly we are nowhere near as poetic and I'm going to have to ask May to come in here and talk with us about what it's like to fire the Webley Fosbury with a lot of extra words. All right, once more, we have enough room for May Ooh. and enough room for what is a large chunk of a revolver. This, of course, being the 455 Webley Fosbury that we've been talking about this entire time. Now, yes. despite its massive size, I will point out again that this is the small frame, small cylinder version of this gun. So we don't even have the biggest version, although... I'd be curious to see what that was by comparison, just a comparison photo. From the dimensions I've seen, you're talking about a little bit of extra length on the cylinder like we saw in the video already. And okay. then maybe a half inch forward and downward on the frame. The upper assembly should be just about the same. Okay. So I believe they said I'd have to check our own notes, but something like eight ounces gets added to the gun. So it's it's not insignificant. No, no, definitely not. Um, but this is the more handier one. Ooh. So let me give that to you. And also, this is not the first Webley that we have shot for this series. No, we've shot uh, the earlier bird's head beak styles of Mark V, I believe, the mm -hmm. Mark VI, yep. which is the target 
ish version. Uh, we shot the self loader. We shot the self loader, which is an automatic pistol, and yep. now we've sort of hybrided the two. We now have an uh, automatic revolver. Yeah, it really is like a hybrid between the two. You're right. Mm -hmm. Other guns in this vein would be like the Mateba, mm -hmm. uh, which you've actually shot as well. But yeah, just not for this series. But I have shot. Uh, actually, the the pre the owner of this gun actually has one as well, and he let me try it out. Yeah, he's got all the auto loaders apparently. <laughs> um, the one we're, thing, or not auto loaders in this case, it would just be semi-automatic revolvers because they're not automatically loading. Right. The terminology starts to fall apart. Mm -hmm. So just a uh, little bit. Let's. Put aside all these other guns for comparison. Okay. This is the only handgun you've been handed, or at least the only one in this field, so right? So the only one that I probably have experience with is you what vaguely, you're trying to get me to. I'm... You vaguely shot pistols, but you're you're not necessarily coming off a Webley to a Webley. Okay, right? okay. What does this thing feel like? All right, so I'm coming into this guy. God, she is she is not just heavy, but also on top of that, she is forward of the grip heavy. Like, she really wants to fall forward, which is kind of uncomfortable. You're really trying to hold the gun up, like, the entire time you're shooting it, which is, is kind of weird having to balance it like that on your middle finger behind the trigger guard back here. Um, very unique feeling, though, I will say that. Uh, if, I'm, if I'm trying to think of, like, I'm going from, like, little pistols or things like that to right. this guy all of a sudden, it's a huge difference. Um, I feel like scale is the first thing that hits you when you first handle one of these four, five, five revolvers. It's just, it is massive, especially for my hand. Maybe for you, it might feel a little more. No, I remember as a collector the first time I got a hold of any sort of four, five, five Webley, and I was like, "Good lord," because I'm used to these delicate Colt grips by comparison. You That's know? true. And these are chunky. They're massive. Yes. Now I will say they are well contoured. How does that feel in the hand? It actually does feel. Pretty comfortable for the grip. There's a nice back swoop in here that I can I can really get the webbing between my thumb and my forefinger deep into it. There's there's actually a good bend right back here behind the trigger guard that I think actually puts me in a good position to get excellent leverage against the trigger guard with my middle finger so that cocking the hammer, and even, this is actually a very light hammer to cock, I am going to say, but it, it that certainly does help because I am using extra leverage right here in order to to get that extra purchase if I need it. Yeah, I find it to be very good at guiding the hand to where it needs to be. Uh, it's definitely a sign of Webley's sort of target heritage on this gun. Yeah, it truly is. There's no question of where to put my hand on this grip, which is nice. Like, they, they did a good job with May that. May I borrow that, actually? Sure. I have found I don't really... You don't know where to put There's your second hand. There's not a comfortable two-handed... And by the way, they weren't doing two-handed shooting at the time. No. It was all one-handed, which means this grip is perfectly tailored for point, and you, it drops right in for me. And you have to probably be a little more careful than I do, because look at how high your thumb is on that gun. That gun is going to recoil back, and you might want to be careful you don't accidentally you ride know, the edge there. I've had 19, early 1911s hammer bite me before. That's what I was thinking. But uh, I've shot this gun a couple times, actually, mm -hmm. and I have not had it grab me. So I'm assuming that they've done some contouring back here to help push my fat skin out of the way. Uh, <laughs> It would be interesting to know, like, is it is it even possible if you were wearing, like, really thin gloves, would, it, it would they get caught in there? I'd like to see a test on that. Although not, not that you would for no, war. No, no. Um, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me give you the gun back. Thank you. All right, so the grip's great. It's heavy. Yep. Um, you talked about the hammer. By the way, this particular model had the hammer lowered, so it was easier to reach. Do you have any trouble reaching that hammer and cocking it? You know, I'm trying to think, and I honestly can't remember when I had a problem with it. But then again, I only ever had to do it for the first shot. After that, it all just took care of itself. Yeah, we'll talk more about that in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, what about loading? So loading, I it's a top brake system. It's it's nothing about this is unobvious. I think for where to push an extra lever or button, and obviously the safety is labeled, so it's like, oh yeah, it's a top brake. Okay, cool. That's pretty straightforward. It's going to eject the rounds pretty easily on their own as long as you snap it really well. I found loading to be, I mean, just as reasonably fast as any other like individual loader that doesn't have any sort of moon clip or addition to that that I right. could use. Now, by the way, they did design potential clips for this system, uh, both commercially available and by Webley themselves. Mm -hmm. So you could have a speed loader. Those are just exceedingly rare. We have not been able to lay hands on an original. 
Right. And um, I also kind of like the fact that the cylinder is stay fixed in here. And I remember you talking about the episode, it has to stay fixed um, whenever you're trying to load it so it stays in the correct positioning. I For get that, that camming pin, yeah. Right. So it actually is kind of nice. Like I'm not having to fight the cylinder to keep it level or put my rounds in the correct spots. Like that. that's this very small thing that I noticed and I actually did appreciate that. So you actually appreciate that over a traditional Webley revolver where you cock it open and then the cylinder is sort of free rolling. Yeah, I kind of, I've, I've, I've never really had an issue with it, but I can imagine for expediency, it must be nice to not really have to worry about that rotating cylinder just going about on its own business. I'd be curious to try it with a speed loader. I have never had a 455 speed loader in my mm -hmm. hands, but what I have found is with other speed loaders I know of, um, the round ball of the cartridge, when you try to, or the bullet rather, right. when you try to put it in, that round shape at the tip of the bullet will help the cylinder sort of self-align mm -hmm. so that it's easier to and throw rounds in there. I'm actually, now that you've said that, only at this moment I'm realizing the fact that that does not rotate. I you wonder think if it that, might be harder? Right. It might be difficult to use a speed loader because you'd have that to index. Interesting. I didn't think about that. You're probably mm. right. If cool. anybody ever has one of those to let us borrow, Please, I'd be very curious be, to try it. Yeah, it'd be an interesting little thing to not only just try, but also show you guys, oh yeah, there is a difference. All right. So I think we're kind of wandering into something where we're comparing this to the Mark VI in a lot of ways, because mentally kind I can't of. not like, do it. I'm not trying to do it. Oh, well, at least the Mark VI is going to have a weird safety on the side, too. But, I mean, yeah, do you yeah. want to talk about that safety? So, oh yeah, before we get into that comparison, yes, I do. So I will say, I, you know, it's easy enough on camera to be able to operate it one-handed. Well, I say that as I can't do it. But when we were shooting on range, I found it was just it really is in an awkward weird position that it kind of forces me to drop my thumb down in order to try to push it up. And there's no extra leverage down here when you're trying to thumb this safety up. Like there's, there's nothing you're using. So I just don't see how anyone could comfortably do it unless they just had significant hand. Can you do it? Yeah, I've got large hands. So I'd have to, I, have I, to can, I, can in theory, I can in theory use my middle finger but it's awkward. Right. Now I'm ready to fire, right? So I draw the gun. I've got somebody here. I drop my thumb. I drop my thumb. I drop. Nope. I can't. I, it's too stiff for the knuckle of my thumb. I have to get the pad of my thumb on there. But if I get my pad of my thumb on there, I have to break my grip there. And then I can reassert my grip and go. Now, do you think this is all Webley Fosberries or possibly our example? Because you've seen the internals of this thing. To me, don't get me wrong. This gun has some wear. Mm-hmm. I'm 50-50 on it because I see in the reports where they did complain that the safety was hard to thumb off. Okay. I also know that this is a gun that's 100 and some odd years old with some wear on it, so it could also be that there's some angular changes in there or some burring, and this one's very stiff. True. I don't know. 50-50, huh? Right. I, uh, okay. I think you could probably polish it to perfection, but then... I wonder why this one wouldn't have been, because everything else on this gun is running smooth. Correct. So uh, the only other thing I think this gun has going on, like all Webley Fosberries that I've heard of, is um, the spring that prevents counter rotation starts to wear. Okay. Uh, and then that needs to either be reshaped or, you know, reconditioned so that it doesn't want to fire the same round twice or something like that. Okay. Uh, but otherwise, this thing's been running pretty well, so I, I'm not sure about the safety issue. Fair enough. All right, so let me hand this back to you. And again, before we get into deep comparisons, uh, let's talk about actually shooting this thing. Um, what's it like when you, actually walk me through the loading sequence that you did and then shooting the gun. So realistically, there are two kind of ways you can load this gun. I guess two different ready states the gun can be in for loading this gun. Either you can have hammer forward, in which case, let me go ahead and drop it. When you put it in, when you go to load it, it puts it in the half cock position. So load in my rounds, close her up. I then have to put her to full cock or- That's how we filmed this. Right, that is how we filmed it. Or you can actually just go ahead and have it at cock and load in and she's good to go. So right. granted, if I'm shooting rounds and let's say I've been counting my rounds, I've been keeping well track of it, that that's gonna be fine. The gun will just be ready once I load on my next round. Right, the so you, you would have to fire your sixth round. One, two, right. three, four, five, six. Six goes bang, the gun comes back. Cocks it, itself. It gives no indication that it's empty. Correct. So what you have to do is on number six. That's what I was about to say. The problem is you've got to keep track of your rounds. You don't do that. And right. you just end up dropping, and then you've got the hammer forward. You've got to recock it once you reload it. Right. 
which that's just a single, it's a little bit of a loss of time. And if the hammer were a heavy pull through, I could see that being a bigger complication. I just see it a slight split second waste of time, basically. Yeah, but it is one of those things that I don't like to see in a martial handgun or any martial arm, really. Which it's one is one that you're having to keep track of the rounds yourself. <sighs> when there's a difference in what you do, depending. Mm -hmm. I don't like carry the one situations in firearms. Fair. Uh, I know they come about because of the way we feed ammo and yada yada. Uh, but the more the gun just does the same thing every time, mm -hmm. the better. Especially if it can indicate that it's unloaded, which was an advantage of early auto. Well, not all early auto loaders, but eventually auto loaders figured that out. So do you see it as a good or a bad thing that I'm able to load this in either state this gun is in? Well, it's good that you can do it in either, okay. obviously. It's good that the gun readies so itself. Yes. Um, it's bad in the sense that you must remember. It's bad for muscle memory to have two ways that it can behave. Because let's mm -hmm. say you go target shoot. And you, you you practice with this gun, and you know I shoot six rounds and then I reload, right? So you go and you one, two, three, four, five, six. And this right, is how right. you train mm -hmm. for months, years, whatever. And then you go into battle, and something happens, and you go, oh, ah, and bum, 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 click, right? Right, because it's, you know, battle. Now, the reason that you went click is because you thought you needed another round. Mm -hmm. So you're going to pop that action, kick those rounds out, throw your six in, close it back and up. And you've point, been trained with that hammer back. Point and pull. Yeah. So you would almost have to train for a seventh dummy if you wanted your muscle memory to be correct. That's true. I know we're getting kind of deep into the game of it, but this is the sort of things that we're starting to think about in this time period. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's where the Webley sets you up for a little bit of failure. Fair enough. Um that aside, uh, you now have the gun loaded. Yep, and I've got to look down my sights, which, you know what, for how big this gun is and how tall this front sight blade is, I was kind of hoping the sights were going to be bigger as well, but this new notch in the back is not as deep as I think they could have gone with it. Are they trying to, to save room so that you're not accidentally going into the line of sight with the button that's over top? Is that why? Well, they're trying to leave meat on this yoke. Okay without having a blade that's so tall that's snagging in your holster. Fair. So uh, the trick is, though, these are, to me, extremely proud sights. They're much easier to grasp and find than most World War One handguns. I just think they still had the opportunity or the, the space to do it even better if they wanted to. Oh, yeah, no. Them. They could have gone, well... There's always, a deeper, There's always a compromise, because the, if you go deeper here, then you lose some meat on the back some of this strength. and it can get right. damaged. Okay. But to me, they read much better than most of what's available. I would agree. However, I still find that same problem that I had with, say, like the Reich's Revolver, where it's presenting a square top. So, so you're basically just creating a rectangle shape. Well, almost. It's not as bad as the as the Rex revolver, though. You, it is clearer. If you come in high and you drop the barrel in, like you're seeing me doing, mm -hmm. you have no problems. But if right. for whatever reason you come up low and you need to find the barrel, which is what I was doing, if it pops up to the left or the right with these big rectangle cuts, you mm -hmm. don't find it quickly. You know, and it takes a little bit to get it back to the center. There's a reason you don't see massive rectangular cuts with little notches in them anymore today. Mm -hmm. But Overall, I'd still rate it much better than most of the sites we've seen. Oh, yeah. And I'm trying to remember the trigger pull. White. Yeah, not bad. It really is pretty fantastic. I thought I remembered it being good. Now, my hand was shaking a little bit that day, I think, from the cold. But otherwise, pretty easy pull through. Pretty smooth single action. Um, Smooth, very accurate. Yeah. The gun itself was a fun shooter, too. And I thought maybe there was still a, a fair bit of kick to it. And I don't know if it's just, you know, the fact that it's... It's it's high bore right here, or the fact that I've got this action like coming back like above my hand. So it gets weird. You have four five five, which is a big heavy ball moving fairly slow. So it's right. going to recoil similar to a nineteen eleven ish. You know what I mean? Sure. Or not even nineteen eleven. Similar to a Colt in forty five, right? Oh, that's a good one. Right, yeah. nice high bore axis going to go rolling over. Mm -hmm. However, since the frame is not. The upper assembly is not fixed to the frame. Mm -hmm. The upper assembly actually does recoil some, which prevents some of that overroll that gets transferred into linear force. That's true. It is kind of and interesting. When it's transferred to linear force, let me borrow this. You think there's some. less snap to it, that there's actually just more of well, a... Well, your grip is here, right? Right. So it, everything's pivoting here. This linear force comes right in where they have done this lovely contour at the back with the spur. Mm -hmm. So that means you're transmitting more recoil than usual, not all of it, mm -hmm. into the proper alignment down your arm. True. So it definitely, to me, buffers a lot of the recoil. 
It's really interesting. I do remember shooting it for the first time and thinking, that's not quite what I expected. Right. Now, of course, we're doing this all based off of this handgun, the right. Mark VI. Which it has been a few years since I have shot that one. Right. But this is what you expect. And this is also what we're kind of used to in terms of any other big bore that we've shot. You know, we've shot the uh, Gasser. We've shot yep. the Reich's revolver. We've shot Colts and forty five. Mm -hmm. uh, all those guns tend to have high bore axis that wants to rock. rock. And so this gun eats up, I would say, maybe 50% of the rock, which is it's not bad. pretty good. Yeah. The question is, is it worth it mechanically? For have it, like, is it worth it? You mean going from that Webley to this Webley? Is that what you're trying to say? Or, yeah. Or? On the numbers, if you think about it, that's lower recoil. Mm -hmm. uh, it weighs slightly more, I think, or maybe comparable in its current form because that's the smaller one. Okay. Um, let me give you this gun for a second. Sure. Ergonomically, I'd like your opinion between the two. God, this feels lighter. How much lighter is this gun, actually? Yeah, I think that one is theoretically lighter. Yeah. I'd have to double check. It doesn't quite feel as muzzle heavy, so that's already fitting better into my hand. The grip, I want to say, I prefer on the Webley Fosbury because it's it's got a nice contour in the rear that really notches your hand in the backside to it, so there's no chance of rounding over. Yeah, here, let me, you hold those up for your camera for a second. Here, take the oh, muzzle. Yeah. There you go. And you so, can see much, bring them towards you because you're out of no, focus. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, much deeper, and then this is just a hint of... Yeah, it's it really is just a hint of it. It's like a little sprinkle of cinnamon. No, that that I need more than a sprinkle. I need like a big old few dashes of it. I greatly prefer the grip on the Webley oh, self yeah. loader. The Fosbury. I should be saying Fosbury in that. Yeah, okay, way. so let's do that. Let's do Fosbury and then we got Webley so okay. that we don't get these confused. Right. Um I'm able to do single and double action with this one though. That's the key. So yeah. remember that hammer confusion we talked about. Mm -hmm. You have none of that. You just pull the double action trigger in an emergency. Right. I feel like that's inherently better. Right. Also, this gun, I'm thinking it's way less complicated. I think it's probably going to be easier to service this guy. And then on top of that, I don't have to worry about breakdowns nearly as much on this one as I will on that one. Yes. So, oh, God, if I have to, if I, if, if I'm asked to choose between the two, possibly, I think I'd probably end up choosing this guy. On paper, I can see why this was supposed to be superior. If it, you if you ignore it's a good the a concept, it's you, neat. If you ignore tracking the hammer, mm -hmm. everything else is superior on this one except for the weight a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is, it just a reliability. It, it failed all the military tests that it was ever in, right? Because of this action being so vulnerable to gunk. I understand the hesitancy to just sort of go with that because. The Luger has an externalized action, right? True. And it runs fine when muddy because it just casts it off. Yeah. This system apparently does not do that. The tracks are enough that, especially fine sand, really wreak havoc with this gun. So it's unfortunate because there's things I really like about this gun that could be transferred to that Webley, like this particular tapered grip. Yep. Uh, maybe the... this release system for the cylinder for getting it off much quicker and easier. True. Um, but realistically, I don't know that I'd find this to be superior than the old Mark VI. Well, Which is kind of sad, but yeah. Yeah. Although I will say that was not standard either at the time. What was standard by the time when this came out, what was standard was a bird's head style Webley, like... This one right here, which right. is a much worse grip. Yeah. We already talked about that. In our Fairly episode. worse, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's nice that they at least came around to that right at the start of the World War, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, that's a good lesson to come from this gun, but I, I don't see it. I don't see the need to produce these. Yeah. Uh, there's no real what, significant... What, what exactly is it fulfilling? Like, what what hole is it filling up? Well, what it's doing is, is it's it's basically a, a gap between what you're holding and, uh, and I'm sorry, I've stacked up all this four five five stuff. Yeah, this guy. the self loader. Yeah, so the four five five self loader. Now, this managed to have a four five five cartridge. Right. But even this gun, and I mean, hold it up. It's big. It's complicated. Like it's huge. And then looking at this camera, like it is absolutely massive. And especially for me, like it's it's still far up there, but. Even this awkward looking feeling pistol is still going to be inherently better because I'm not having to count my rounds with it like quite like that gun. And on top of that, I've got the mag loading. Like this is gonna be faster. Right. This is a mag load. But but even that gun, 455, not the Webley rimmed cartridge. It's its own special 
semi-rimless whatever cartridge that we've talked about before. Yeah. Um, so that you couldn't put standard service ammunition in that gun. That is the one true advantage of the Webley Fosbury, is that this is a big bore rimmed service cartridge right. in a revolver, but also has some of the advantages of semi-automatic, but only some, and at great cost. It's unfortunate. It really is truly a hybrid between the self-loader and the Webley, the Mark VI, but it just isn't, it doesn't quite scratch all the itches you need it to scratch. Right. Well, here, let me give you that. Okay. Regardless of whether you prefer it to these two guns, do you sure. feel confident with something like that in the Great War? So, the thing is, if I can trust it, like if it's one that I can, I can seriously actually know is a reliable one i it's been it's been through the trial it's survived it's done great i'd feel good but the problem is is that after reading all of matthias's notes and just hearing about how it it did it failed all the trials and how any sort of introduction of sand or mud or muck on the cylinder is going to cause me significant issues i'm concerned this isn't really going to survive me or this really isn't going to help me survive the battles is it mm. i just don't see it happening so I'd, I'd want just because of how cool it is, I'd want to give it a yes, but I'm just terrified that it's just not going to be able to to last, you know? Yeah, we're having some issues in terms of the safety being heavy, the uh, our, the weird hammer position, like we said. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. If the gun ran perfect, still very usable with some advantages. True. But, but. I'm not seeing it. I mean, I, I believe it was the cavalry test in the U.S. that they're still having problems. And I don't know if those were done on horseback or not. But in my head, I'm like, well, I guess if I was on horseback and I wasn't going to leave like, it what in is the It's like, the perfect day and, like, no bad weather whatsoever. Right. But you're not going to convince me that the mechanical advantages of this exceed the reliability of something like this. Right. I need that reliability if I'm going into battle, right. I would think. Yeah. So, unfortunately, I believe that the Webley Fosberries, despite their extreme scarcity in price in the collector's market are probably much more of a civilian arm than they are a military one. Yeah, I really just, because of this one, like just its rarity and the value and cost of it, there's no way I can really put it through the tests I would want to in order to find it reliable. And just based on the tests that have been done on it alone already previously, yeah, it's just not going to meet that, I know. Right. Well, it looks like people at the time did agree because, like I said, only 66 were officially purchased by the government that I know of. And even with the sort of height of people purchasing firearms for going into the war and using standard service ammunition, they did not sell out of these during the war. That tells you that even people at the time knew that they did not really want to bank their lives on the Webley Fosbury if right. they could choose something else. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Really cool gun. Super neat. Happy to have been able to try it. Oh, yeah. If I could afford to own one, I would definitely own one Absolutely. just for the mechanical curiosity of it. Right? I mean, this has to be the most recognizable, externalized sort of revolver, you know, etched in the cylinder revolver action. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, we think of maybe the Mauser Zigzag, and I listed a few others. Yeah, but, the Mauser Zigzag. Real cool one. But this is the one that people know. Mm -hmm. Um And so definitely worth preserving. Uh, definitely worth holding on to. But yeah. I would not want to take it into battle. Not on my life. All right. Well, uh, stay tuned after the credits for updates. I'm sure we have more than a few. And have a good one. Night, everybody. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is your video update this time. Oh, fancy. Because we have a couple things to cover. Number one, I am exhausted. I spent a week <laughs> sick. Uh, we had just gotten back from that trip to Texas, which was a 24-hour drive. So the next episode is unfortunately going to have to be a and a which kind of works out because our last Q&A was in March of last year. So we're we going to try to do these like annually, you think? It may be the way forward. Okay. Uh, so the next episode is a big Q&A. Uh, the questions will be taken on Patreon. Do not put them 
here. Yeah, no. Patreon mm-hmm. or subscribe star people, you'll just get a post that says submit your questions here. Please do so there. And uh, please, one question per patron. Oh, yeah. Please, one question. <laughs> um, we will try to get to everybody. I think last time we had, what, like a hundred and something? Yeah. Uh, that was there, good. We were getting triples and some of them were highly technical and I tried really hard. Right. Uh, and then we lost our minds. Yeah. Uh, it's like three hours. <laughs> But um, we crazy. we're going to do another marathon Q&A. We have way more patrons this time, too. So <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, <laughs> yeah. How many questions about pot roast will we have this time? Has well, he eaten new, a pot roast? It's going to be the new meme. It's all going to be, you know what? We're only accepting questions about hand traps. Please, God, no. <laughs> Not just about hand traps. Uh, okay. What so, does ICI stand for? Oh, man, don't even. So... Uh, it's going to be Q&A. It will be publicly visible. Um, there's no need to uh, worry about joining Patreon if you just want to watch it. Yep. You just got to go to Patreon or Subscribestar in order to ask your question. Mm-hmm. <sighs> okay. Now, on top of all that, I want to make sure I clear something up because I know people are going to comment on this display. Yeah, what, what's going on here? This, I mean, I thought it was pretty freaking cool personally, but what's up? We have been quietly for about three years now. And it was supposed to be done by now. <laughs> We've been quietly acquiring inexpensive shotguns in order to do a repeating center fire shotgun series. Ooh. A lot of you guys have written me about your single shots, double barrels. It's a repeating center shot shotgun series. We are not taking loans because if I had borrowed yours, you would be fuming by now because oh, yeah, I'd have had it for three years. Three years. Um, we haven't done any filming on them yet. Right. <laughs> so. Uh, but we're finally getting into the stages where we can actually work with them. And so they're sitting on the back wall because I'm going through and repairing dozens of shotguns. Because when I say I got them cheap, mm, I'm repairing dozens of shotguns. <laughs> but uh, the new Matthias repairs all the old shotgun series. <laughs> they're going to be on display here for a while, though. The series is not right around the corner. So please don't freak out when it's not next week. Right. Uh, but they are here and that is coming. And here's visual proof that it is coming. Haha. <sighs> Okay. Uh, anything, really like is there anything else we need to cover? Um, there should be an announcement last week. If you missed it, don't use the old P.O. box. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then I think that's about it right now. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. This is a good update. I like this update. Yeah. It's your favorite yeah. when we don't know what we're talking about. No. It's great. All right. Well, that's I hope, probably it. I hope you guys enjoyed the Webley Foz. Oh, if they, uh, what was it about the Discord? Mm, uh, yeah. If uh, we got a rash of people joining the Discord, uh, the way the Discord is set up, you go to cnarsenal.com, you look at the bottom, you click the Discord link, okay? Mm-hmm. Once you go in there, you must read the rules, all of the words. I know, it's actually, I didn't write that many words. No, there aren't that many it's words. Like two paragraphs. Yeah, but, but if you don't read the rules, we promise you will get kicked. Yeah, I get, sometimes I get emails and stuff from people being like, I keep getting kicked from the Discord. Read the rules and you will understand why. There's if this, you read the rules and you understand the rules, which are very straightforward it's rules, a, It's a very loose IQ test. Yeah. But, if All you right. failed it, you failed the IQ test to go join our Discord. Congratulations. Uh, don't say that because some people aren't good with technology in general. Oh, no. I don't want them to feel bad. I'm sorry. All right, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye.